Yes, good uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Capio, uh, and as Fernando already mentioned, I work for Agidens, which is a uh, independent systems uh, auto systems integrator for automation uh, systems. Uh, and there, I am working with a consulting group uh, with the, the expertise in energy, energy management, and sustainability. Um, if you want to know more about me, please feel free to look up my profile on LinkedIn. Uh, and link with me if necessary. Uh, I will not get into this much uh, further for now because we have a lot of ground to cover in the seminar today. So uh, as Fernando mentioned, this is a seminar about heat pumps and their practical industry or non-residential applications. The agenda for today, um, we'll look at the overall concept and benefits of heat pumps. We will then look at the working principle and the, the various components uh, of heat pumps followed by an overview of the different technologies that are available, um, how these are then used uh, in practical applications. And when you are considering uh, a heat pump, uh, how to look at the business case. And finally, we'll round up with a few specific uh, case studies. So let's get started. Um, first of all, the, the concept and the benefits of a heat pump. Now, uh, very important to, to understand is that the heat pump itself does not create heat. In fact, what it does is it actually uses a small amount of additional energy to transfer existing heat from one location to another. And one location then is normally a lower temperature heat source. And that uh, low temperature heat is then transferred and upgraded by the heat pump to a different location and a higher temperature. And it does so. Um, according to a certain coefficient of performance. The, the higher the coefficient of performance, the more useful heating capacity output you have gained compared to the required work input that you've had to put into. Um, so the main advantage of a heat pump is that the, the thermal output that you get from it uh, is normally significantly larger than the additional energy input. So if you have a COP of three, it means that you input one kilowatt uh, uh, in, in uh, extra energy, and you actually get three kilowatt out, or kilowatt hours, of course. Um, an additional advantage is that in many cases, the, the, the effect can also be reversed uh, in order to cool certain uh, processes or whatever. Let's get to the next slide. Uh, the working principle and the components of a heat pump. Now, We'll first look at the, the most simple setup, which is the, the, the normal basic mechanical heat pump. Uh, and you can see here the different components. Uh, obviously, we start with number one, which is the, the working fluid in the system. The working fluid circulates through the system and carries heat uh, through the system. And when it absorbs uh, heat, um, or rather, during evaporation, the, the, the fluid absorbs heat, and during condensation, it discharges heat. The, the different components of the um, heat pump are, number two here, the, the evaporator, which is located at, uh, basically it's a heat exchanger located at the temperature source. Then, of course, you have the uh, temperature source itself, the heat source which could be waste heat or the regular ambient uh, temperature. Then from there, you have uh, the, the working fluid um, travel to a compressor, where external, additional external uh, energy is added to, to, to power the, um, the compressor. And by doing that, you then transfer the, the working fluid to the condenser, which is basically a heat exchanger at the destination site. And the destination site, the heat sink, is of course where the, the heat gets released into. And then from there, it travels to an expansion valve, um, which is the, the final part uh, before repeating the entire cycle. If we then look at the actual process steps, then here again we see that you have the refrigerant. Oops, couldn't find my arrow here. You have the refrigerant, which enters the evaporator in liquid form. The fact of having here the expansion valve, which obviously um, lowers the pressure, 
and the fact of having the compressor here, which increases pressure, pressure towards the other side, those two combined uh, cause the pressure in the uh, evaporator um, to, to, um, to lower. And by lowering the pressure, the refrigerant, the working fluid, in this case refrigerant, evaporates into gas, gaseous form. Um, by doing this, by evaporating, this uh, causes heat to be absorbed from the heat source into the refrigerant. You can compare that to like a can of deodorant that, or, or any spray can for that matter. As you press and, and release the, the product that is inside the can, it's, um, the, 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 the pressure inside will, will, uh, will drop since you're, you're taking product out. And you will notice that the can is getting very cold. And that is because the, the heat is extracted from the can and released to the outdoor. So that's, a, that's an example, a practical example that, we've all, uh, that we all can, can see in our daily life. Good. The next step in, in the process, uh, the, the, the evaporation has happened and, and heat was absorbed into the refrigerant. And so the refrigerant then is, travels to the compressor, which is fed with external energy. And the compressor obviously compresses uh, the, the, the working fluid or the refrigerant to the other side and increases the pressure. Um, at the same time, you have back pressure from the expansion valve. So those two combined cause um, a significant pressure increase in the uh, condenser. Um, and that causes the refrigerant to condense back into liquid form, from gaseous to liquid form. And by doing so, it releases the heat into the heat sink, which is the room or the, uh, the process stream or whatever is being heated up at that time. And after that, the refrigerant has cooled down after having released its heat, and it travels to the expansion valve where the pressure is lowered even further. Uh, and as a result, the refrigerant then goes back into a gaseous state. And so the cycle, re the cycle repeats over and over again. So that's the main concept of uh, a basic heat pump. Now, of course, there are several kinds of heat pumps and several technologies. The first one is the one we just showed. That's the closed cycle mechanical compression heat pump which is probably the, one of the most commonly used systems. Um, it uses a common refrigerant as a working fluid, and it operates best when the, the, the delta T, the, the temperature differential between the source side and the destination side, is below 50 degrees centigrade. Um, this type of uh, heat pump is driven by electricity, and there are two types. You have either the direct expansion, or you have systems uh, which are pump systems, with a separator vessel in which the, the liquid and vapor form of the refrigerant uh, is separated, and each only travels to its part of the, the heat pump. Um, these pump systems uh, allow, on one hand, they allow the use of smaller evaporators because they're, they're focused just on the, the, um, the, uh, the, the gaseous form, not the, the liquid form. Um, and these pump systems are usually used for larger industrial installations. Most ammonia applications, by the way, are, tend to be pump system heat pumps. Uh, another type of heat pump that exists is the closed cycle gas engine heat pump, which is very much similar to the mechanical compression heat pump we just talked about, but with the big difference that the, the compressor is driven by a gas engine versus electricity. Um, so the, the, the motion is created by a combustion engine. The advantage that you have in this case is that the combustion engine obviously also generates heat, and that heat can also, again, be used as a source heat and upgraded by the heat pump uh, towards the destination, sort, uh, destination point. The third type is the closed cycle absorption heat pump. And in an absorption heat pump, you are using not only a refrigerant, but also an absorption medium. For instance, uh, ammonia and water, or lithium, and brom lithium bromide and water. Those are two common uh, uh, types of uh, medium that is being used. Um, the closed cycle absorption heat pump uses the principle of boiling point elevation and heat absorption. Uh, 
and it uses four heat exchangers instead of two. So you have an evaporator and a condenser, but also a generator and an absorber. These systems are driven by high temperature prime energy, which could be steam or, or fuel combustion. So again, it's a system based on, on thermal energy rather than electric energy. Um, the, the big advantage of the absorption heat pumps is that they allow much greater temperature lift between the source and the destination side uh, compared to the, the regular compression heat pumps. Uh, like we said earlier, for the compression heat pumps, you want to keep the temperature differential between uh, below 50 degrees. Here, uh, with the absorption heat pump, there, it is possible at times to, to raise the temperature by 90 or even up to 150 degrees. Um, also important is that these applications are well suited for situations where you need both heating and cooling. And then the final closed cycle uh, heat pump that we have uh, is the adsorption heat pump, which is very similar to the absorption heat pump. Um, but the, the difference is that uh, for absorption with a D, um, you use a solid instead of a liquid and the refrigerant is bound to the surface of the absorbent rather than absorbed into a liquid, which, which is a case for absorption. Um, some examples are silica gel and water, zeolite and water, active carbon and methanol, and active carbon and salt uh, with ammonia. These tend to be used uh, for in smaller heat pump systems for cooling, however. So we, we tend to see them, we tend to not see them very much for, for heating purposes uh, in industrial applications. Um, all the, the heat pumps that we've mentioned so far are all based on refrigerants. Um, and obviously refrigerants come in many different kinds and sizes and so on. Uh, and each refrigerant has its own specific uh, energy efficiency and, and working temperature and, and pressure, pressure ranges. So these are things to look at when you're choosing a refrigerant. Um, there's also uh, a big distinction between natural versus synthetic refrigerants. Um, the synthetic ones uh, tend to have very high global warming potential. Um, we all know that CO2 emissions cause global warming. Well, next to CO2, there's a lot of other uh, gases that, that, that have been calculated as a CO2 equivalent, uh, and so the, the global warming potential of these gases have been has been determined. And R23, for instance, which was a gas that was used uh, until fairly recently, a uh, very common uh, refrigerant, uh, that gas has no less than 14,800 times the global warming potential of CO2. So obviously this, this is a product that the, has been banned for, for reason. Um, as a result of these global warming potential uh, effects uh, of the synthetic gases, they, they tend to require more periodic leak checks. So there, there are some maintenance issues that are quite important to, to think about. Um, all the, the, the gases that have a, green, a global warming potential above 2,500 are in fact banned as of 2020. Um, we're thinking about the R507 and R404A, for instance. And even the ones that are not being banned, uh, all the ones that uh, contain HFCs, um, those will see uh, significant production caps uh, over the coming years. So 2015 has been set as the baseline of production. Um, and so whatever was produced in, in volume in 2015, that will need to reduce by uh, 79 percent to to just 21 percent of production in 2030. So that clearly that means that those gases containing HFCs will become uh, more and more expensive as the the, the the supply will diminish more and more. So those are obviously things to think about when you are dealing with a refrigerant that contains HFCs. Um, so if we look at the different kind of uh, refrigerants, we have the natural ones, um, like ammonia, R717, uh, or NH3. This is a type of refrigerant that is most suitable for industrial heat pump applications. The, the positive points are the, the, the lack of greenhouse gas effect, um, the high efficiency, and the fact that the ammonia supports applications up to 80 or even 90 degrees centigrade. The disadvantage is that it's an inflammable product. It's toxic. 
And so obviously you, you will have to face certain safety requirements. Now, having said that, um, most of you have probably smelled ammonia at one point in time. It stinks terribly, and so if there is a leak, you tend to know it fairly quickly. So you, you can get out of the building in time uh, before it would actually uh, hurt you. Um, an alternative for ammonia is CO2 itself, or, or R744, uh, which is the, the code uh, number for the, this refrigerant. It's used a lot in uh, refrigeration applications. Uh, and it's also capable of uh, output temperatures up to 90 degrees. Um, this advantage in, in heating applications is that it doesn't heat at a constant temperature. Um, an alternative, yet another alternative uh, natural uh, refrigerant is uh, R600 or butane, with, which has a global warming potential of just three. And R600A isobutene, uh, also with a global uh, warming potential of three. These are uh, refrigerants that are well suited for small applications. The advantage is the, the, the low global warming potential, but of course everybody knows that butane is, is uh, a gas that uh, is very easy to, to catch fire and, and even can create an explosion hazard. So clearly those are, again, requiring significant uh, safety measures if you use these. Next up, then the, the synthetic refrigerants that we talked earlier about. Some specific examples are um, R134A, which has a global warming potential of 1430, which is you know still quite high, I, I would say. Um, R134A uh, is suitable for medium or large heat pump applications up to 80 uh, degrees centigrade. It's more efficient than the, the following ones, the 407 and 410. Um, but it is less efficient than ammonia, um, and as a result, uh, or rather, because it works at, at lower pressures, you tend to need more volume, and obviously you will have higher investment costs when you're using uh, this refrigerant. The other two that were mentioned earlier, the R47C and R410A, are suitable for small and medium heat pump applications, again, with uh, heating up to about 80 degrees, but also the ones that have cooling functions. They have lower investment costs, uh, but also lower efficiency than R134A. So that's as far as the, the refrigerants are concerned. Um, now, there are still some heat pump uh, systems or, or technologies that do not operate on a refrigerant basis, but use uh, a different working fluid. And a very important one is the open cycle mechanical vapor compression heat pump. Um, these are considered open cycle because the working fluid is actually the process stream itself. Uh, in this case, it's a water vapor. And the heat pump uses a mechanical compressor, just like the, the regular mechanical heat pump, basically. It uses a, a mechanical compressor to increase the pressure of the available waste vapor. Um, to, to power the, the compressor, you can use electric motors or steam turbines, combustion and engines, or combustion turbines. Um, a similar technology is the open cycle thermal compressor heat pump. Um, it's, it says it's right there. It's, it's also a compression-based uh, system, of course. It's open cycle. Uh, the working fluid here is steam rather than water vapor. And it uses energy in high-pressure motor steam to increase the pressure of the water, uh, the waste vapor, by using a jet ejector device. So those are the different technologies uh, of heat pumps. Uh, another way to look at them is, uh, or another way to distinguish between the different types of heat pumps is by looking at the source environment in which they are installed. Um, you have air-based uh, heat pumps, air source-based heat pumps. Um, these use either outside air or indoor ambient air, or in some cases also exhaust air, uh, which is waste heat from, for instance, flue gas or refriger refrigeration systems. And it transfers that uh, heat either to an air or water-based heat sink. The second uh, type of uh, uh, source uh, environment is either ground or water. Um, why we take these two combined is that, in, in many ways, it, 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 they're all basically uh, have a water-based system, but in some cases they're buried into the ground. In other cases, these uh, are, are placed in water 
uh, environments. So the, the closed pipe work of loop water and antifreeze is uh, buried horizontally in a trench or vertically in a borehole in the ground. Um, a secondary version is closed pipe work of loop water and antifreeze sunk into a river or a lake or a sea. And the third one is the open loop where the water itself is extracted from a ground aquifer and later on returned into the aquifer. Um, finally, I also included a process stream as a source environment. Normally, people, when we're distinguishing heat pumps based on, on uh, source environment, normally people only talk about air source and ground source uh, heat pumps. I chose to include the, the process one also because these do uh, have very significant uh, differences compared to the, the other two. Here you're really talking about integrated systems into your uh, industrial installations on your site. And so these uh, process streams could include wastewater, steam, condensate, etc. Now the air source heat pump that we mentioned uh, has some specific uh, advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that these tend to be quite easy and cheap to install. They don't require specific groundwork or excavation. They don't need much additional pipe work. Uh, and while they do op operate at lower temperatures, um, it is perfectly possible to put uh, or to set up a, a two-stage system or a type of cascade where the first heat pump uh, raises the temperature to first level of temperature, for instance, to about 45, 55 degrees centigrade. And a, second, a secondary heat pump then takes that temperature and raises it again to, well, to about 55 degrees. The disadvantages of a, the air source heat pump is the seasonal impact of the outside temperature on the COP, obviously, in case you're taking outside air. Um, important to understand is that if the, the temperature difference, difference between source and destination temperature increases, it obviously decreases the, the, uh, the COP. Um, and so when you're looking at a business case uh, for a, an air-based heat, heat source, it's important to look at the impact of, of uh, the seasons. And so to base your business case on the seasonal performance factor and not just on the nominal COP because then you would probably have very unrealistic uh, results. For the ground or water-based uh, source heat pumps, um, the advantage here usually is that you have much less variation in heat source temperature over, over the year, so you'll get a better seasonal performance factor. Um, they also have lower running costs over the long term. Uh, on the other hand, the, the investment costs tend to be higher, especially if you're using vertical boreholes, for instance, those uh, works, uh, those excavations can be quite uh, expensive. And then finally, the, the process stream uh, source heat pumps, uh, those tend to be very specific to your uh, installation. So they, they have a large degree of customization. Um, the advantage is that that usually also leads to quite high, if not to say very high, COPs. Uh, and as a result, significant uh, operational expenditure savings. On the other hand, it's logical that when you go less standardized and more customized, that the investment cost goes up quite a bit. Uh, in addition, it's very important that the, the, the engineers who design your heat pump um, know your system and your processes quite well, that they have a clear understanding how everything works, because otherwise they may come up short on, on integrating uh, the heat pump properly into your systems. Okay, we've dealt with the different technologies uh, on heat pumps. Now, now let's take a look at how we can actually use the heat pumps and some practical applications. Um, obviously, first, first use of heat pumps also in, in residential uh, setting is usually space heating and sanitary water heating. For space heating, um, the advantage with, for instance, the air-based uh, heat pump systems is that these operate at lower temperature, which normally means they require larger heat distribution systems. But uh, at the same time, that makes them ideally suited for, for instance, underfloor heating, which tends to operate at uh, low temperature, uh, for instance, uh, around 35 degrees and up. So th these uh, applications for space heating tend to have fairly good uh, seasonal performance factors and low running costs. The next step up from there is sanitary heat water heating. 
which for safety requirements usually may require an additional heating uh, or a second stage heat pump to raise temperatures to about 65 degrees. Um, further applications include process heating, drying and dehumidification, and specifically heat recovery where uh, you usually tend to have limited temperature variations and where there's in a, in a typical plant or in a typical industrial environment you have various sources of uh, heat that can be recovered coming from air compressors, electric motors, server rooms, kitchens, etc. Um, if we look at the source temperatures, these go from you know anywhere from about minus 20, minus 15 degrees centigrade uh, if you're taking outside air, uh, and that can ambient air can go quite high. Uh, obviously, if you're taking air from a compressor room, for instance, uh, if we're using the ground and, and water in the ground as a heat source, um, temperatures tend to range between five and fifteen degrees centigrade. Of course, if you go towards deep geothermal uh, temperatures, then you can go uh, even above hundred degrees centigrade. So, um, but that's that's deep geothermal that's, uh, that has been discussed also in the, the seminar on renewable energy. Um, what else? Uh, air compressor cooling, those tend to give off uh, waste heat at around 25 to 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, the heat rejection from refrigeration systems, also 30 to 45. Effluent or cleaning systems, usually around 30 and 50 degrees. Condensers uh, from distillation processes anywhere between 60 and 120 degrees. Cooling towers around 30. And wet air in, in certain processes tend to be between 40 and 70 percent. And of course, there's plenty of other sources. Um, then if we look at how uh, temperatures uh, range at the destination side, uh, my apologies. I, I see that the, the temperatures have been jumping all over the page. These were originally aligned on, on one line, but uh, um, anyway, uh, in pasteurization, we tend to need temperatures between 75 and 95 degrees centigrade. Um, for plant or district heating, temperatures range between 70 and 100 degrees. Inlet boiler water around 100. Uh, sanitary water, we need to increase the temperature up to 50 or even 65 degrees. If it's water for cleaning or for washing, that tends to be between 50 and 90 degrees. And if we have drying processes, we need temperatures of around 50 to 120 degrees centigrade. So that gives you an overview of source versus destination uh, temperatures. If we then look at uh, how the specific technologies can be used for certain processes, um, we can start with the closed cycle mechanical compression heat pump whether it's uh, electric powered or thermal powered, that doesn't really matter. Um, these tend to be used for space heating, generally manufacturing and textile industry, et cetera. Um, for heating of process water or washing water or cleaning water, uh, especially in the pharmaceuticals and in paper manufacturing and food and beverages and textile industries, you see that a lot. We have the heating of process solutions, for instance, for electric plating. We use these type of mechanical compression heat pumps for product drying, for instance, lumber manufacturing, and for the concentration of effluent, uh, for instance, in the production of soft drinks. If we go to the open cycle mechanical compression heat pump, uh, so where the, the process stream itself is, is uh, going through the heat pump, um, there we see uh, the removal of solvents from air streams as an application for this uh, mechanical compression heat pump. The next one up is the open cycle mechanical vapor compression heat pump. And that one we see used a lot in, in many different uh, industries, uh, especially for concentration processes. So for instance, manufacturing of inorganic salt, um, for alcohol and beer production, uh, production of corn syrup, uh, pulp industry, dairy, uh, juice manufacturing in sugar refining, etc. Um, also nuclear power, um, we see the compression of uh, being used for, for a certain waste handling, um, for effluent power, uh, process effluent treatment. For desalination processes, we see uh, these mechanical vapor compression heat pumps used. Separation of propane and propylene, as well as butane, butylene, and ethylene. 
and then for the compression of low pressure waste steam or vapor uh, to be heated uh, to be used as a heating medium. Um, the open cycle thermal processing heat pump, we see those used um, for flash steam recovery in, for instance, paper manufacturing, or, um, for steam stripping of water, uh, wastewater and process streams. And we see the, them also used for concentration processes, um, for instance, in the manufacturing of corn syrup, and dairy, sugar refining, etc. Finally, the, the closed cycle absorption heat pump, we see the, those used uh, a lot for large-scale space heating or district heating. Now, of course, the, the, the most important part is when you think about what, what, what a heat pump can, can mean for you or for your uh, installations, it's uh, important to have the right considerations. So first of all, let's take a look at the, the general advantages of using heat pumps. Um, one, of, one of the advantages is the flexibility in, in where you locate the system. As opposed to um, a combustion engine, a combustion engine usually needs fresh air supply and a flue to, for the exhaust gases to be evacuated. That usually means that you cannot just go put a combustion engine somewhere in the middle or in the basement uh, of the building. Um, with heat pumps, this tends to be uh, less of a limit limiting factor, since you don't need a flu and you don't have specific fresh air requirements. Also, um, if you have higher heat output requirements than, than what the heat pump can provide in some cases, it is, it is perfectly possible to add a, a double stage uh, application so that uh, you can heat the, the, the medium up to a much higher uh, temperature than you originally had intended. Um, in many cases, um, the use of heat pumps uh, leads to lower CO2 emissions, especially if you're using renewable power, for instance, uh, you're using um, solar panel wind, uh, wind power for um, powering the, the compressor of the, the heat pump. Um, you also have the advantage that uh, in many cases you can provide both heating and cooling in a single unit for both the, both ground source heat pumps as air source heat pumps. And that means that instead of having two different installations, which obviously would require more space probably, um, you also have more uh, less maintenance than with gas boilers. Um, important to point out, however, is that if you're dealing with cooling heat pumps, of uh, more than 12 kilowatts, you will have mandatory inspections uh, from time to time to, to make sure that none of the F gases are leaking. Um, a final uh, advantage of the, the heat pumps is the higher efficiency than electric radiant heaters. Uh, obviously, an electric radiant heater is more or less a one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, in terms of the, the COP. Um, with, with the heat pumps, you tend to work uh, around with COPs of uh, probably three or higher. Of course, it's you know not all good. Uh, in some cases, there are disadvantages to the heat pumps as well. Uh, clearly, a lot of times the, the heat pumps can only provide lower temperatures than what the traditional gas combustion heater can provide. Um, in case you're using a, a, a temperature source which has an impact from the seasons, then you'll see uh, obviously a seasonal impact on your COP, which again, the, the seasonal performance factor, then that will determine your real efficiency. Um, very important also is to note that retrofitting a heat pump to older buildings or older installations may not always be, be easy, since a lot of times these installations or these buildings will have been built uh, or um, consecrated, consecrated for uh, higher temperature systems. And then um, it, it may not always be possible to reach the performance level that uh, the users expect with the, the provided heat from the heat pump. Of course, the, there are always ways to, to increase the temperatures. Uh, we mentioned about the two-stage setup. But also, the, there are um, large industrial heat pump systems uh, that can provide really very high temperatures, but which operate at uh, extremely high uh, pressures. So there, have been exam there are examples of uh, heat pumps which can provide uh, 
temperatures up to 110 degrees, but which operate at 76 bars. So obviously, that is not uh, the most easy insulation to build. Um, good. If, what, what are some, some uh, elements that might uh, show you that there, there are significant opportunities for heat pumps in your uh, installations? Uh, one is the, the, the fact that you require heat streams in the range of 60 to 90 degrees centigrade. If you have a lot of those uh, temperature need, um, then you know that the heat pumps are perfectly suited to provide temperature in that range. Um, if you also do a lot of, uh, of, if you spend a lot of energy heating uh, a medium or a product up from ambient temperatures to around 120 centigrade, then a big part of that initial heat up can be provided by a heat pump. If your process involves a lot of evaporation, a heat pump may be a good solution as well. Same goes for uh, processes that involve distillation with small temperature range between the reboiler and the condenser. The process entails uh, continuous operations with high number of operating hours is also an important one because, of course, the, the more hours uh, the heat pump can operate, the more uh, energy savings you will uh, achieve and the better the business case will be. Clearly, you need to have a source temperature, and so the more um, the, the higher the amount of uh, recoverable waste heat you have, the more available energy you have to, to uh, upgrade in a heat pump. If you have clean liquid or condensing fluid as a heat source, uh, then you can go for a heat pump. If you have a lot of low pressure steam that is vented or condensed, um, and then also it's important to look at the cost of electricity and the cost of the fuel, uh, the fossil fuels that you're using. Traditionally, you would say that you want to have a ratio where um, the electricity cost divided by the fossil fuel cost um, on a kilowatt hour basis uh, is less than three. If the electricity becomes more expensive, then you will end up gaining little or not, no value out of the heat pump if, uh, unless you're dealing with very high COPs. Um, on the other hand, if both electricity and fossil fuel is uh, very expensive, then obviously using a heat pump will again improve the, the business case. Now look at uh, a, a sample of uh, an investment case. Um, if we're looking at the, the investment uh, required for a gas boiler, um, then we're talking about the range of 80 to 150 euros per kilowatt uh, fully installed. To deliver the same amount of energy um, for an air source heat pump, you need to look at prices between 250 and 300 euros per kilowatt. And for ground source heat pumps, that can even go up to 1,000 to 1,500 uh, euro per kilowatt, which is about 10 times as much as a gas boiler. Um, however, these prices can be significantly less, down to as low as 800 euro per kilowatt, if the the works for, for instance, the the, the boreholes, the, the excavation work for the ground source heat pump, are combined with other uh, um, ground works that that were planned anyway. So then, of course, you you diminish a big part of the, the required labor. Um, if we then compare the energy consumption of these three systems um, based on a, a consumption of 200,000 kilowatt hours per year with a peak demand of 150 kilowatt and a 30-year lifespan, then we see that the energy source heat pump can provide energy savings, operational energy savings between 60 and 70 percent. And the ground source heat pump goes even further and delivers savings of 70 to 80 percent of energy. Um, however, the impact on the total life cycle cost, when we look at both the CAPEX and the OPEX over 30 years, we see that the, both the air source heat pump and ground source heat pumps end up costing as much as 95% to even 125% compared to a gas boiler. Um, that doesn't seem that uh, spectacular or that, that uh, positive. However, in many cases, uh, heat pump systems can um, get certain incentives from governments 
for energy saving uh, implementations. And then if you take the incentives into account, then we see that the prices, uh, the, the life cycle costs for air source heat pumps drop to uh, about 50 to 65 percent compared to a gas boiler. And for ground source heat pumps, anywhere between 55 and 75. So clearly, you need to take into account, when, when you make the business case, you need to take into account any possible incentives that there may be, such as heat pump tariffs for electricity. And in some countries, they actually have general electricity prices, and then lower electricity prices specifically for uh, heat pumps that to, to clearly incentivize uh, companies to invest in these uh, technologies. There's also direct CapEx grants, there's tax-based incentives, uh, preferred interest when, when you get loans, and uh, there are feed-in tariffs uh, at times for, for feed-in of uh, um, heat, heat, uh, heat pump-based uh, energy. And if you want to improve your business case, then it's important to look at your COP and, and see how you can increase the heat pump energy efficiency um, through the, you know, better components or by better temperature settings, etc. cetera. Um, you can increase the in utilization of the heat pump in hours per year. But the more you use the heat pump, the more you will save, the better the, the business case will become. And uh, other elements that can improve your business case is when gas and electricity prices go up. Currently, prices tend to be fairly low, but uh, there too there's big differences between different countries. Um, but probably the most important things to, to look at when you want to make a decision uh, about investing in heat pumps is uh, whether your actual heat demand on your site has been optimized already. Because if you didn't look at overall energy efficiency first, it doesn't really make sense to, to make large investments in, in uh, optimizing the production of heat, whereas it might be more efficient. Uh, and then more long-term beneficial to reduce the demand. So the first thing there is, is to really look at the demand and optimize that. And then once you've done that, then you can look at which source temperatures you have available versus the required destination temperature that you need. And if you have those uh, with, with temperature differences less than 50 degrees centigrade, then obviously heat pumps are very much uh, an applicable uh, uh, technology. Um, having said that, in some cases, you may not even need a heat pump. Uh, if you look at the, the total heat balance within your company, you may perfectly have a waste stream that is actually higher in, in temperature than some other uh, heat demand uh, uh, needs. And, and so for those applications, you can just use a direct heat exchanger without the need of, of upgrading the, the waste heat even further. So that's another thing to look at. And then finally, when you see that yeah, you come to a conclusion that the heat pump would be the, the best solution, then it's a matter of looking at when the, the source temperature is available and compare that to when the, the, the heat demand is, is uh, active. Because you want to make sure that the, the, you have a good match in timing. And if you don't, then the, the, you need to look at how you can buffer the heat uh, between the, the production at the, the source side and the um, use of the heat at the destination side. And then finally, you need to look at the, uh, the system efficiency. And you you want to look at the seasonal performance factor versus just the COP. You want to look at the energy efficiency of the components. Uh, for instance, the compressors, um, depending on how you're going to use the heat pump, uh, you may want to choose a different type of compressor centrifugal for full loads, where you tend to go more for scroll uh, compressors when you have a lot of varying load. And, and if you have small systems, uh, up to 50 kilowatts around there, you may want to prefer uh, reciprocating compressors. You also want to look at uh, the, the additional cost for choosing IE4 efficiency motors compared to IE3 motors. And then also the, the, the refrigerant uh, requires some choices to be made. Clearly, you need a refrigerant that has a boiling point that is well below the source temperature. And so you look at all these elements, and then you make a life cycle cost analysis in which you include insulation and operational costs, including maintenance, energy costs, incentives, etc. 
And finally, I need to round up here, I'm looking at the time, we have only a few minutes left, some uh, very specific case studies. Um, one is uh, of a chiller heat recovery application where the, the, the company had a, a quite a big building which included some uh, data center and computer labs which had to be cooled year-round via chillers. Um, and on the other hand, there was a, a, only a seasonal need for building heating. Um, the required temperature for the heating circuit was about 40 to 50 degrees centigrade, and the, the cooling system of the chillers uh, made uh, or had a, a source temperature available of 23 to 27 degrees year-round uh, coming from the cooling towers. And so the, the heat pump technology that was used was a 200 kilowatt water-water mechanical compression heat pump. Uh, and by installing this system, the company was able to reduce the reduction of gas consumption for heating by 72%. They, they Basically, they have enough uh, capacity to, to provide all the heating, but gas was still needed uh, for some humidification purposes. The entire project had a payback time of just two and a half years and still has a thermal capacity left for four or five times more heating than they're currently using. So it's an interesting project there. Uh, another example was one with, uh, uh, where the, the seawater was used as a, a source, uh, the temperature source. It's uh, also uh, an office building, uh, cooling, uh, sorry, an office building that needed both heating and cooling uh, of the research center, which had about 500 employees. The heat source was, like, like I mentioned, was seawater, which year-round was around five to six degrees centigrade. The, temp, the heat pump technology that was chosen was two 450 kilowatts ammonia water-to-water -water heat pumps, where the condensers were placed in parallel and the evaporators were placed in series. In addition, they had auxiliary backup systems uh, with two times 1400 kilowatt propane boilers for heating backup um, and for peak load. And they also had 200 kilowatt ammonia chillers as a cooling backup. And so the result of this uh, project showed a, a, an overall COP of four and savings of 2.3 gigawatt hours thermal uh, energy for heating and 0 0.4 gigawatt hours uh, for, electric, for electricity for cooling per year. And the payback time was uh, four and a half years. And this did not include the profit that they got, the, the additional profit that they got by cooling uh, by using seawater. So basically, if you would include that, the payback time would be even better. And then the final example I want to share with you was one uh, using a mechanical vapor recompression uh, heat pump. Um, it, this was a, a distillation process uh, in which uh, propylene and propane were separated in the so-called uh, PP splitter column. And usually in an installation like this, the overhead top vapor is uh, cooled and, and uh, vented. Um, but here, the overhead top vapor is recovered instead of cooled. And for this, they used uh, quite a large uh, system. Um, it's a 50.2 megawatt uh, mechanical vapor recompression uh, heat pump, which was electrically driven. And as I mentioned in, in the technology overview, these uh, vapor recompression uh, systems can, can uh, provide very significant uh, uh, temperature lifts and, and, and uh, or very high COPs, rather, no, not temperature lifts, but very high COPs. Um, and this one achieved a COP of 14.9, which is quite impressive. Um, in addition to the, the good uh, energy or energetic results, they also saw that by using this technique, they were able to increase the production yield because the, the process provided a higher level of purity in the end product. And so the, the, for this project, the company had received a grant, um, and that led to a payback time of uh, just two years, and it did not even include the production yield, the, the additional production yield. So it shows that, that uh, heat pump systems can be very uh, applicable um, and very um, cost beneficial in a lot of different industrial applications. I did include some references. Uh, feel free to take a look at these. Um, and that's it for my presentation. I will now welcome your questions.